Hello, good evening, welcome back. Tonight I have a very, very special treat for you. Tonight I'm going to share with you one of my most favorite childhood books. It's a book about gnomes. <laughs> My grandmother gave this book to me when I was very young before I was able to read very well so I just looked at the pictures then and I fell in love with the book and then later when I was able to read better I loved the book even more. I loved this book so much that Every time my family moved when I was little, which was often because my dad was in the military, so home was wherever, wherever the army put our boxes. Every time we moved, I always made sure my mom packed this book and I wouldn't let her donate it or give it away. And then when I grew old enough to leave home and strike out on my own, I took the book with me and I made sure I always had it no matter where I moved. Um, this book was originally written in 1976 um, in Dutch. It first was published in Dutch by two Dutch authors and then the following year it was published in English plus many, many, many other languages. This book was written by, doesn't say it here, oh wait, there they are. <laughs> this book was written by um, two authors. One of them was a physician. His name is, and I am for sure saying this wrong, and I have a lot of Dutch speaking viewers, so I, I apologize <laughs> if I mangle these names. But one of the authors was a physician. His name was Wilhelm. It's spelled like that. And the other author was actually the, the illustrator of the whole book. His name was Rien Purtfleet. Sorry. <laughs> but um, the illustrator, Rien Purtfleet, was one of the most, uh, one of the best watercolor artists I think I've ever seen. And he was one of the best watercolorists at his time in Holland. And he was so popular that there's a museum in Holland dedicated to his work. And he's considered a Dutch national treasure but when these two gentlemen wrote this book, they wrote it in the persona of two anthropologists or biologists conducting a field study. I want to take the paper cover off because I rarely do that. Oh. That's what it looks like without the cover. <laughs> Little gold embossed gnome. But they wrote this book kind of like a biology textbook slash illustrated field journal. Here's some of the pictures. And they invented a fictitious backstory they claimed to have studied the known people for over 20 years during that time in which they conducted their research. And then when they had all their notes put together, they had to get permission from the gnomes to have this book published. And so the gnome council met and it took them five years to decide which is not a whole long, a whole lot of time for a gnome because they live a really long time as you'll find out later. When this book was published, 
it became so popular that people started getting gnome, little gnome statues to put in their garden because that's what gnomes do. They watch over your garden. And so everybody had a garden gnome. And when that became popular, something else became popular. Uh, pranksters would go into your garden and kidnap your gnome and then take it with them on vacation and take your gnome sightseeing and they would take photographs of your gnome in front of the Eiffel Tower, in front of the Great Wall of China or wherever, the Grand Canyon, and then they would bring your gnome back to you with an envelope full of photographs of all the places your gnome had been. And once that became popular, um, the company Travelocity, I don't know if any of my international viewers are familiar with them, but the company Travelocity then co-opted the gnome as their corporate mascot and created their commercials and their ad campaigns with the gnome. I think they named it too. I think they named it Gary or something. I don't know. But um, this book <laughs> inspired other authors to create parodies of it, such as humans. And supposedly this book was written by gnomes about humans. Really, really hilarious, fun book. Followed by Humans at Work. There's also one called Biddies about little old ladies. And Coots about little old men. And there's lots of other variations on, on this theme. This book is from the original 1976 printing. So the cover sheet is all discolored and turning yellow. If you get a new copy of this book, your these parts here should be bright white. Gnomes are mainly nocturnal creatures, which means they conduct their activities at night. But the illustrator and author of this book took creative license and colored all of the pictures as if every activity was taking place in daylight. Otherwise, all these pictures would be in shades of dull gray. The adult male gnome weighs approximately 300 grams, and the adult female gnome is slightly smaller, between 200 to 275 grams. This range is about the same weight as a large pigeon, like a New York City pigeon. Everything that's in red is where gnomes have been sighted. Not so much here in North America, but lots of gnome territory in Europe, Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, Great Britain, and the UK. Interesting though, look, not too many gnomes have been spotted in Italy.
This is the same picture that's on the cover of the book of the adult male woodland gnome. At 275 years old, the adult male gnome is in the prime of his life, and his actual height without his cap is 15 centimeters. He's, his frowning is due to posing in harsh daylight, which means that somebody would have had to woke up his gnome in the middle of his sleep so that he could come out and have this picture done of him. Feet turned slightly inward to ensure great speed over grass, etc. When I was a little girl, um, I, I thought this was true. <laughs> and so on the playground at school during recess, I would turn my toes in toward each other and run that way thinking it would make me faster. <laughs> adult female gnome. This female gnome is considered elderly among the gnomes. She's 346 years old. And it says here, when 350 years or older, she begins to show a light beard. The general lifespan of gnomes is about 400 years. In their physical appearance. The authors note, there are male and female gnomes. In our daily lives, we come in contact only with the male because the female almost always stays at home. And here are the things that the male gnome wears. He has his conical red cap, which is very important. We'll learn more about that cap later. He's got his little coveralls, his little shirt. He always has to have his tool belt. And he has different shoes for different types of weather or terrain, depending on the area in which he lives. Gnomes greet each other and say farewell and good night by rubbing their noses together. It is said that this allows for a more penetrating glance into the eyes. Hardly likely. It is probably nothing more than just a friendly gesture. And anyway, gnomes have no secrets from one another. In fact, they have only to glance at someone in the distance, and right away they know what is happening in that person's inner self. The gnome's red cap is very important because it protects him from birds of prey during the twilight and night hours. Now normally, gnomes are friends with most of the woodland animals, except for the polecat and other types of animals like that, such as weasels, martens, ermine. They don't get along so well. How gnomes disguise where they've been. As we flip through these pages and you see the watercolor work of Rian Portfleet, you can see why he is considered a master. The gnome's cap is very important. He has to make his cap himself out of felt from a form, a cap form, that's kind of pointed at the top. And he's so shy about revealing his head that he still keeps it covered when he's working on his cap. The physiology of the gnome. Their heads are bigger in relation to their bodies. They have, their distribution of ribs are different from humans. Gnomes have eight pairs of ribs and four floating ribs. Whereas humans have seven pairs of ribs and five floating ribs. Their arms are longer. Their legs shorter. Their foot bones and the arch of their feet are extra powerful. 
gnomes can run much faster, can jump higher, and is seven times stronger than a human relative to their size. Gnome leg muscles have an extra muscle bundle for both speed and distance. Can you spot the dough in this landscape? It looks like a road here, and trees, and a brush fall, and there's the dough right there. To a gnome, this world looks a little different. Because using his nose, he's able to see where all these different animals had walked across. And when they did. Gnomes treat many of their illnesses with natural plants, shepherd's purse, stinging nettle, chamomile to help them sleep, St. John's wort for their mood, elder blossoms to fight against cold and flu. Now, these medicinal plants, as they are illustrated in, you know, a children's book, these are actually the uses for these plants. Um, when I have really bad bouts of hay fever or I get like hives on my skin because I'm really, really sensitive to plants and pollen, I take stinking nettle extract to help my body build up its own immunity so that I don't suffer so much during the springtime. So I know this works. This is how gnomes treat their injuries. Um, now... When it comes to burns, it says to rub on oil for first-degree burns. This is actually not true. We know this now. Sometimes, if a gnome is gravely injured, he can whistle a special tune to call other gnomes to come help him. And gnomes only use this tune in emergencies. And then the gnomes will rush out and find a hen pheasant so that the hen pheasant can take the gnome to the nearest doctor or the nearest royal court where a medicine man can heal the gnome. The medicine man is half sorcerer and half doctor. The gnome's lifespan is around 400 years. There are several different types of gnomes. The woodland gnome is the most common gnome. The dune gnome lives in the desert regions. The garden gnome. He watches over gardens. The farm gnome lives on farms. The house gnome, of course, lives in human houses. The house gnome is a special sort. He looks like an ordinary gnome, but because he lives among humans, he's very knowledgeable about humankind. He speaks and understands human language, and so gnome kings are chosen from families of house gnomes. The Siberian gnome is the only bad gnome there to be a when a gnome is born, his parents will plant an acorn in the ground on the day of his birth. And this is how the gnome keeps track of his age, by how big the tree grows. As soon as the tree is large enough, the gnome's parents will mark it with runic writings, and then they'll keep a copy of the writings on a flat stone or on a clay tablet, and this tablet is given to the gnome on his 25th birthday, and he keeps it in a secret place for the rest of his life. Some gnomes will also hang a cuckoo clock in their homes. When the male gnome is about 100 years
years old, he begins to think about marriage. And so he will travel a great distance to other gnome communities to find his bride. The wedding takes place at midnight, always under a full moon. Then after this ceremony, the happy couple go to the male gnome's house. He's had this house under a tree, usually about 15 years before he starts thinking about marriage. And this is the gnomes going on their honeymoon trip, traveling by goose, traveling by fox. <laughs> they travel to the royal court to visit the king and queen and pay their respects because the king and queen of the gnomes, they like to know all of their royal subjects by name. Female gnomes always have twins and pregnancy lasts 12 months. The gnome father mainly concerns himself with teaching his sons about herbs, how to run away, how to escape, how to whistle and woodwork and paint. Now keep in mind this book was written in the 70s when traditional gender roles were a lot more rigid than they are now. The mama gnome teaches her daughter how to cook and spin and knit, how to identify different animals, and everything a female gnome should know about running a home and taking care of baby orphaned animals. And this is how they build their home. They try to find two large trees that are generally close together. The main house will be under one tree, closer to the south, and then on the north side, They'll use the underside of the northernmost tree in their little area to make the entrance. Under the hidden entrance, right here, he builds a trap door to catch weasels and polecats. After which, the weasel or polecat will be given a stern scolding and then set free. <laughs> This had always been my favorite part of the book, seeing all the different things that gnomes put in their houses. They use the gong, it's kind of like a doorbell. Their front door would go here. And they take off their shoes and boots and coats in the boot room, which is also where the well is located. They have a watch cricket. <laughs> And here, it's kind of hard to see because it's in the fold of the book, are little sleeping alcoves. It's like they sleep in these little enclosed closets. This part gave me the most problems when I was a child because I knew I would make it terrible and no one might never be able to sleep inside the alcove because I'd be too claustrophobic. If I was a gnome, I'd want to sleep like in the middle of the floor on a sleeping bag. Notice how fancy their toilet is. It's like a throne. <laughs> and this is generally what they eat for breakfast. Gnomes can speak the languages of most animals. They provide help and first aid to animals that are in need. This gnome right here is helping remove a tick from the top of this fox's head. And this gnome <laughs> is helping to untangle these two deer that got their horns tangled up because they were fighting. They know about acupuncture. And here's a gnome performing corneal surgery on a badger who had walked into a broken twig in the dark. They use different devices, like this device to pull throat fine larva out of deer's throats. And 
gnomes have a difficult time accepting polecats because they know that they paralyze living frogs and save them for later eating. The gnome is told about this as a child, and all through his life he has an anxiety that the same fate may await him. And here are the games that gnome children like to play. They love to swing, as do human children, as do I. They're using the winged seeds of maple to play at being dragonflies. Other twilight and night beings that sometimes are confused with gnomes. So detailed descriptions are given about these creatures so that you don't mistake them for gnomes. Gnomes tend not to associate with these other beings. Some of these other beings are very, very cruel to gnomes. This section of this book and the uses of natural energy. Even as an adult, this has always fascinated me because it's this detailed, intricate movement of gears and cogs and pegs in a kind of like a Rube Goldberg-like contraption um, just all depends upon wind. <laughs> This tree waving back and forth keeps this ratchet wheel going. A wind-driven grain mill for grinding corn. A wind-driven sawmill for making planks. The different hand tools used by gnomes. What I love about these illustrations is that there's so much emotion and meaning put into each picture that you have to look at them for a while to take everything in. This book could also be, I guess, an, a fairy tale for adults in that it presents a mirror to us and shows a world where everybody gets along, where people live close to nature and connected to their environment, where um, nobody has any deep, dark secrets from each other, um, where there's always plenty of food to eat, which helps if you're only 15 centimeters tall. You can literally find food laying on the ground. Um, this book presents a world where if you have any kind of health issues, there's always a way to fix it. So it's a book that I still like to read over and over, if only to look at the amazing illustrations. If you can get your hands on a copy of this book at your library, or if you want to get it for yourself, I highly, highly recommend it. It is truly a classic. So, thank you very much for watching, and good night. I will see you again.